Joining me now, Shadow Home Affairs Minister James Patterson. James, thank you for your time. I know you've just come back from the Munich Security Conference. We'll get to some international issues in a moment. But a big debate today about the budget available to Home Affairs to defend our enormous coastline. Um, the opposition picked up on changes with the budget. Claire O'Neill comes out today. She's the minister saying, look, we've got plenty of funds there and you and Peter Dutton are are just playing funny buggers. But we also hear she's putting a bid into the budget committee, wanting to put more money in the May budget. So clearly there's something going on here. The Board of Force Commissioner Michael Ottram says there's no budget cuts, everything's OK, but you quietly picked up what the budget papers actually say and it's very different than what the Minister's telling us, isn't it? That's right, Peter. We, on the one hand, we could take what the minister says, but this is a minister who got wrong the funding for her own cyber security strategy on the day she announced it. So we probably won't do that. Or we could take the budget papers uh, at, as, as the truth. And the budget papers are very clear. And you can, she can go and ask Jim Chalmers about it if she's confused. It shows the funding for this year and then the funding declining for every year for the next four of uh, next four estimates. And cumulatively, that adds up to $600 million. Now, Labor's argument here is just ignore the budget papers, don't worry about that, that's not our intention. Well, what is the purpose of budget papers and forward estimates if it's not to indicate the government's priorities and where it intends to spend money? And if they are going to find this money, well, where's it going to come from? What other programs are going to be cut or what other taxes are going to be increased to fund it here? It's very clear, funding for border force and border protection falls and this is a government that's also done other things to undermine our border security, like abolishing temperature protection visas and failing to deliver the maritime surveillance hours that we need, which, no surprise, has led to two boats now slipping through. This has got to be a link, though, doesn't it, James? This reduction in the, in the budget funding for border protection, uh, perhaps in the hope we'd get away with it, no one would notice it. Of course, we have the boats turn up, and then this story appears today, clearly a leak from the government, or that the minister's going to go in there and thump the table at the ERC budget rounds, that she's going to put more money in the May budget. But this is catch-up money. This is them being caught out as these boats are starting up again. That's right, Peter. Michael Outram admitted to me in Senate estimates in October last year that they weren't meeting their maritime surveillance objectives. And the minister has only announced that she'll be seeking more money in the upcoming budget today after it hits the media. You know how unusual it is to <laughs> foreshadow a budget announcement that hasn't even been approved by ERC, let alone considered by ERC yet. This is scrambling and panic from the government because it knows it's in trouble because it's had two boats on its watch slip past and reach the Australian mainland. That is almost unheard of in the last decade. It is such a rare event. They're almost always intercepted at sea and turned around. But these ones have slipped through. That's happened on this government's watch and they have to account for it. I spoke to David Adler last night from the, the Jewish Australian lobby about something that we've followed now for many months, and this is this spike in visas from, uh, from people who identify as having Palestinian citizenship. But you and Claire Chandler actually unearthed this detail last week in Senate Estimates because DFAT has revealed they've granted around 2,000 visitor visas, 148 other migration and temporary visas, to people who say they've got Palestinian citizenship. Now, what's worrying here for me is, A, we don't have any consular services, Australian consular services in Gaza. Fair enough. But these applications have been improved, some of them, in just 24 hours. Now, given also that some of these are, are online application forms, how confident are we, James Patterson, that the, that the appropriate checks are being done? Peter, I wish I could say I had confidence, but based on the answers that officials from Home Affairs gave me last week in Senate Estimates, I can't say that I am. You're right, it's now more than 2,000 visas granted to Palestinian residents in a very short period of time. Let's remember, this is a war zone controlled by a terrorist organisation. I don't know how we could be doing adequate checks on the ground of those people. So essentially, we're relying on the documentation they provide online and taking it at face value. And not only did they say that on average these visas are approved in 24 hours, they conceded it was possible that in at least one case, a visa was granted in a single hour. Now, how on earth is it possible to do any security checks at all if it is being turned around in just one hour? I'm deeply concerned that at very least among these 2,000 people will be sympathisers and political supporters of Hamas, which frankly I think is bad enough when we wouldn't want in our country, let alone the risk that actually there are people who are have direct terrorist associations in that group, which is of course a risk when you're dealing with a jurisdiction like this. 
And if a government in Gaza, and it is a government that they elected, is a Hamas-controlled government, if you want to verify identity, if you want to check any details or bona fides of people, I mean, do you get a piece of paper from Hamas to say who they are or does it come from the Palestinian authorities? And, of course, we've got grave concerns. Uh, look at the, the UNRWA funding. Uh, money that moves through the Palestinian authorities is, is also suspect. So... I mean, where, where do you get the veracity checks that you need before you allow someone to come to Australia? There's no comforting answer to that question, Peter. It either is that documents are generated by Hamas, a terrorist organisation, or documents are generated by, Palestine, by the Palestinian Authority, a corrupt organisation which has not governed in Gaza for nearly 20 years and has no authority or presence on the ground. So there is no way you can have assurance on any documents that have been provided or about the identities of these people, let alone their terrorist associations or sympathies. And I think the government has been incredibly reckless by rushing through so many applications in such a short period of time with such little checks mm. and the implications this could have for our safety and security or our social cohesion are very profound. Talk to you about the, the Munich Security Conference because while you were away at this conference, I'm, I'm interested in your observations from uh, other people that you caught up with and also the, the, um, the agenda for the conference. I mean, what are the, some of the big concerns that were being raised? But also you were there, obviously, when we heard the news uh, about uh, Navalny, Alexei Navalny, over the weekend. What was the reaction there from the international community? The sentiment at the conference was very sober, Peter, because of the announcement about Alexei Navalny's death and the fact that his wife, Yulia, addressed the conference within hours of his death being announced. That was a very sombre and sober moment. But also because there is recognition that the Ukraine war is in a very difficult phase, that Ukraine is under great strain and great stress from Russia and its allies, including North Korea and its financial and economic sponsors and supporters, including China. And Russia is now significantly outproducing Ukraine and its allies on things like uh, shells for artillery, and that is having real battlefield implications, which has led Ukraine, for example, in the last 48 hours to withdraw from Advika, a, a, a town which they were fighting very hard to defend mm. for months and months and months. It's very clear that Ukraine needs more support from the Western world, uh, from the European Union, from the United States, from Australia, from other partners, uh, because if they don't get that support, then they will suffer further losses and Russia will make further gains. And that is not in our interest. It's not in anyone's interest. We need to make sure that Russia is defeated here in Ukraine and this war doesn't become an even wider one, which is at great risk. Uh, the Baltic states and Poland could very easily be the next, and that would, of course, bring NATO into the conflict in a much more direct way, which I don't think anyone should welcome.